Welcome back to our next study of the book of Proverbs, and we're going to be in verse 7 of chapter 1, and it is a very, very important verse. It is the verse that uh, you would say maybe is foundational to understanding not only the book of Proverbs, but to understanding life and our relationship with God. So let's begin reading in verse 1, and we'll read through verse 7. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to discern the sayings of understanding, to receive instruction in wise behavior, righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the naive, to the youth, knowledge, and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase in learning, and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. To understand a proverb and a riddle, the words of the wise and their riddles. Now here's our, our key verse for the day. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Let's read it again. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Now, the first thing that we need to answer is, what is the fear of the Lord? You see, um, this type of, of, of speech today is often looked at very negatively. You know, people will say, well, why should I fear God? God is love. Yes, God is is love and the Bible also teaches us that perfect love casts out all fear. So what does this mean? When the Bible talks about the fear of the Lord, uh, I've got something written down here. It says, I want to use these words very carefully. It is a deep, not superficial, not just on the surface. It is a deep, a, a profound, uh, another word we could use would be a genuine, a sincere reverence or respect for God. And when we say for God, we're talking about for God's person, for God's works, and for God's will. If you have a reverence for the person of God, you will reverence his works, and you will also especially reverence his will. Now, let's, let's think about this for a moment. Um, around here, when we have a meeting, and we have a prayer meeting here at, the, at HeartCry, uh, one of the prayers that will come up most often will be this. With regard to everyone who works here, we pray, Lord, increase our, our fear of Thee. Increase our reverence of Thee, our respect toward Thee. Now, we need to pray that, but how can we do that? I mean, how can we grow in our reverence and respect for God. How can we do that? Well, I have found that it's, it's basically through one way, and that is the Word of God. You see, if I walk up to a person and uh, I just look at them and they seem like a, a normal person, you see, I, I'm going to show them respect. But then let's say all of a sudden someone tells me he is the world champion chess player. Now, I've learned something about him that I didn't know before, and it increases my respect. That's amazing. Or say that he's a world-class mathematician. And I think, wow, I'd really like to know this person. I, or I find out that this person uh, was a missionary for 60 years in some of the darkest jungles in South America and served as a doctor. Now, as a person, before I learn that, I'm going to respect them because they're made in the image of God, regardless of who they are. But when I find out maybe certain things about them, it's going to increase my respect. Now, it's the same way with God. If you have a, just a, a small knowledge, biblical knowledge of God, it is impossible for you to have a biblical reverence for God. So where does it begin? Where do we learn to, to treat God with the respect that he deserves, with the reverence that he deserves. It's, it's in the scriptures. The more we study God in the scriptures, the more we will see how great he is. And a word that's tied to that is worthy. He is worthy. He deserves more respect, more honor, more reverence than you and I collectively could ever ever show him. He's infinitely worthy of reverence, of respect. Now, have you heard um, preachers say that God is holy 
and, and I'm sure you have. And the moment you hear that, you think, well, that means God doesn't sin. Well, it does mean that, but that's not the primary meaning. The primary meaning is that, um, well, how can I put it? God is separate. That's what the word holy means. He's separate. That means you have everybody else in one category, not just men, angels, archangels, devils, demons, whatever. Whatever, whatever has been created is in one category. And, and regardless of all our differences, we're all in the same category. We are creatures. Holiness means God is in a completely other category. And it's not like here's our category and here's God's category. But it's here's our category and here's God's category, except that God's category is infinitely higher than us. Let me put it this way. And I think you'll understand this. If not, ask your parents. Um, there's a quantitative difference between uh, maybe me and another man. Let's say that, that I'm six foot uh, two and weigh 190 pounds and I cannot run very fast and I'm not very strong. Uh, then there's a football player, a football player that comes in. And he is six foot eight, 325 pounds, and can run 40 yards in about 4.2 seconds. Now, we're both in the same category, but there is a quantitative difference. He's bigger than me, stronger than me, he's, and faster than me. He's like me, but he's better than me. That's a, qualitative di a quantitative difference. We're, we're alike. He's just bigger, faster, and stronger. Well, the difference between us and God is not quantitative. It's qualitative. He's of a completely other quality, a completely other person. Sometimes theologians will even use that terminology and they'll talk about the otherness of God. And, and I want you to see that. It's very, very important. That's why, you know, sometimes you, if you watch some old uh, movie, you know, and they'll maybe a movie from England, and they'll talk about serving God and King, or giving your life for God and country. Um, I don't want to be nitpicky, but that's really not that appropriate, because that's a conjunctive relationship. Do you see what I mean? God and country, kind of on an equal level, or God and King, together, hooked together with the con with the word and. Okay, but that's not really the case. God is not in a conjunctive relationship with anyone else. It's God, period. Everyone else, everything else is separate from him. And to, to walk in the fear of the Lord is to have a right understanding of who God is. And then it's, it's that understanding causes you to esteem him. That means you recognize his worth above all other things. As a matter of fact, if you took the worth of everything that exists apart from God, he's still infinitely more worthy than all those things. And the, the more you see him in the scriptures, the more you will your estimation of him will increase. And as your estimation of him increases, how you value him, then you will grow in your reverence toward him. Um, you'll say his name with reverence because his name in the scriptures represents who he is. Not only that, but you'll look at his works with reverence. You know, when I have a right view of God, then my right view of my fellow man uh, changes. You see, even if I see someone out there that, that is very destitute of morality or or in prison or or has done some horrible thing um, I may not approve of their actions but I'm still going to recognize they don't belong to me they weren't made by me they belong to God they were made by God and although corrupted and darkened there's something of the image of God still in that person and so if I truly reverence God I will reverence life do you see that and not just human life, all life, all the things that God made, you're going to reverence because, because you reverence him. And when you look at, at, at the sun and the moon and the stars, you're not going to reverence them. 
because that would be idolatry, the foolish, most foolish sort of idolatry. But at the same time, you're going to look at those things and you're going to look at them with a great appreciation at the wisdom and power of God to create and sustain them. Uh, when you see some little, you know, funny looking animal in the woods, you're going to have to, if you have a right view of God, you're going to stand back and you're going to stand amazed at what God has done. So you're going to have a reverence towards God, which is going to lead to having a reverence towards his works. You're going to stand in awe of them. I think one of the most wonderful things you could possibly be um, is, a, is a scientist who fears the Lord. Uh, whether it be in genetics, whether it be in, in uh, astronomy, whether it be in, in geology, whatever, to be able to investigate chemistry, to investigate all these things and know that they are displays of the wisdom of God. Even mathematics and theoretical mathematics, what a wonder it would be. Physics, knowing what kind of wisdom did all this. So you see how the reverence of God begins to cause you to have reverence for everything else. But there's one thing very special uh, that I, I want to talk to you about that the reverence of God will create in us, and that is a reverence for His Word. We will um, not just fear the Lord, but we will fear His Word. We will read it with great respect, knowing that this is, this is not just some communication from a man. These are the very words of God. Now, in real life, we do that, don't we? If I receive a letter from a friend, I may be very, very happy to get that letter and read it and see what's going on. But let's say that I received a letter from the president or if we lived in some other age, the king. When that letter came to me, just knowing from whom it came would, would really change even the way I opened the letter. I'd probably be very, very careful not even to, to try to tear the, the envelope, you see, because of who, from whom it comes. And it's the same way with scriptures. We need to study them, reverence them, love them, because they are words from the God that we reverence. And now I don't want to, I don't want to be nitpicky or, or certainly don't want to be superstitious, but, um, you know, a lot of times the way we treat our own personal Bibles demonstrates our attitude toward the Word of God. I, I remember a preacher telling me a story one time uh, about this very godly man, very godly preacher he knew, and that um, one day after, the, it was either before or after the church service, um, somebody walked by and, and knocked the the communion Bible, you know, off the table and uh, just kept going. And the the old pastor got up and, and you know, he didn't rebuke. He didn't um, shame the person. The person just went their way. But he said, I, I watched that pastor walk over there and kneel down and pick up the Bible as though he was picking up something so precious. And then with, you know, he folded out the pages that had gotten crumpled and then he put it back on its stand and adjusted it just right. Now, of course, you can do all that thing and all that type of thing and be a hypocrite. Yet at the same time, I believe the way we treat our Bibles sometimes is a display of what we think about them. You see, but but be very careful. You you can also you know treat the Bible physically so respectfully, but you dishonor God and dishonor the Bible by not studying it by not studying it, or by not applying the things that are in the Word of God. So, so realize, uh, true reverence is practical, and it will manifest itself in a way that will let you know that uh, it's real reverence. Now, let, let's look at something else here. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The beginning of knowledge which would let us know reasonably, without the fear of the Lord, there is no knowledge. That, that even though you may have an extremely high IQ and you can consume facts, real facts, because of your lack of the fear of the Lord, you won't be able to put them together properly and they won't come to their proper end 
leading you to be a better man, a better woman, and more devout to God, and more devout to God's creation. So it's the beginning. Now I want to look at three ways in which we can look at this. First of all, um, to say it's the beginning of knowledge, it's the foundation. It is the foundation upon which we build everything. You know, uh, when I was in Peru, we, we built a lot of very rustic churches out of adobe uh, mud. And um, the one thing that you knew is uh, the stuff is pretty durable. It, it's an amazing material. And if you build an adobe building right, it'll, it'll last through earthquakes where con concrete buildings won't last. But the big key is digging deep enough and laying a foundation. That first layer that you lay has to be stable. Because if it's not, if it's not, if it's at a wrong angle, if it's built out of weak material, if something's wrong there, then everything else is going to be messed up. Now in the Middle East, you know, we, we hear of Jesus being called the cornerstone. Well, they would build, uh, there would be one type of monolith, a, a, a very large stone that would be erect and upright, and all the other stones tied into that, the walls, all the walls tied into that one cornerstone. And if that one cornerstone was off, everything was off. If it was weak, everything else was weak. And that's the same thing. It doesn't matter how great your IQ is, how smart you are or think you are, just know this. If you're not growing in your reverence, your esteem, your appreciation for God, and that's not influencing your life, then all that knowledge is probably going to do more damage than good. Now, another way of looking at it, it is the first step in the journey of knowledge. You see, first steps are really, really important because if you're supposed to go that way and your first step is that way, it throws absolutely everything off. And sooner or later, you're going to recognize, hopefully you're wrong, but you're going to realize you have lost a great deal of time. And you've got to backtrack all your steps and then start again. After much effort and time has been wasted, you've got to start again. You've got to start all over. But listen, young people, there's no need to do that. There's no need for you to, to leave your homes and, and, and be rebellious and come out from under your parents' teaching about Christ and about the Word of God and about the fear of the Lord and run out there for 20 years and basically destroy your life and then come back with this wonderful testimony that, that God saved you. Well, it will be a wonderful testimony that He saved you, but, but why spend so many years wandering? Why not take your first step in the right way and then stay in that way? It's an ancient path. It is an ancient path. And it's well marked by the Word of God. So start off your journey growing in a deep reverence for God. It's that first step that will lead to a proper journey. Now another way to look at it, it's a lens. Look at it as a lens uh, through which we interpret everything else. Uh, someone comes up to me and tells me, you know, uh, let's do this. And I recognize, well, no, that's contrary to the will of God. You say, well, that's, that's good. Well, it's good, but it's not enough. Because a lot of people know that they're doing something contrary to the will of God, but they don't fear God, so they do it anyways. But if I can look through the lens of the fear of God, and someone says, do this, and I see in the Scripture it's wrong, the fear of the Lord is going to cause me to not only recognize it's wrong, but to retreat from it. And in some cases, as it says in, in various places in the Old and New Testament, to run from it, to run from evil, you see, to interpret things through the lens of Scripture and through the purpose that you and I have, which is to live as men and women who reverence God and walk in a deep reverence for him. Now, a last thing, we can treat it as, as something of a moral compass. You see, I always tell people, um, you know, in the midst of the trial, it's not a time to make convictions. You need to have those convictions set before you ever walk into a trial. 
It's just like, you know, um, if you've ever been around fighters, they'll say this, you know, everybody has a fight plan until the first punch is thrown. And then it just looks like two men just frailing one another. You see, everybody has a plan, but in the midst of the battle, sometimes <laughs> it just doesn't work out. So what you have to do is you have to draw your convictions now. You have to study the Word of God now. You have to grow in the fear of the Lord so that when that trial comes, when that temptation comes, whether it's something you would consider to be small or some, some career decision that's going to turn you away from your family or turn you away from God, you've already made up your mind. You fear the Lord. You don't have to. Someone may say, hey, I want you to take two weeks to make this decision. You say, I, no, I'll make it now. No, no, think about it. I don't need to think about it. I made this decision long ago before you ever put it, this question in front of me. I'm not going to take this job or I'm not going to do this thing because it will violate what I believe the scriptures are teaching and it will cause me to act in a way in which I'm not demonstrating fear towards the Lord. So the fear of the Lord is like a foundation of a house that makes it strong. The, the fear of the Lord is like a first step in a journey that heads you in the right direction from the, as we used to say, from the get-go. And then it's also a lens through which I can look and interpret the world, what's right and what's wrong. And it's like a moral compass that's going to always set me on the right course, which is, you know, the goal, the will of God. And so that's the first thing that I wanted to talk to you about, about the fear of the Lord. And when we come back, we'll continue in, in verse 7, uh, discussing some more things about what it means to reverence or fear God. God bless you.